Hi there, Dave Levine here. It's great to have you with me for episode number 13 of the Sports Stories podcast. We have another exciting guest this week, following on from last week's guest, which was Rachel McKenzie, world Thai boxing champion and neurophysiotherapist. Today's guest is Lewis Craig, who is the lead academy coach at Salford City. I'm really looking forward to learning more about Lewis's journey from being an aspiring footballer through to coaching at a premiership club, Burnley, and now being an integral part of the academy at Salford City, the club largely owned by the class of 92, namely the Neville brothers, Ryan Giggs, Nicky Butt, Paul Scholes, and David Beckham. So let's not waste any more time and crack on with the podcast. I would therefore like to give a very, very warm welcome to today's special guest, Lewis Craig. Lewis, it's great to have you with me on the Sports Stories podcast. Thanks for giving up your time today during these strange times during the, the, the lockdown period. I've been reflecting back on when we first came together and we got to know each other and it was way back in the days when you were at Burnley uh, and I've followed your journey. I've been still quite close to where you've got to in terms of your work and you're now obviously now at Salford City. But without giving too much of your story away, obviously what I like is our guests to get a sense of who you are and the fantastic journey that you've been on, but also some of the insights that you've had. So I'd like to start us off with, can you give us a bit of a, a sense of your first memory of sport and then a little bit about your, your journey so far today? Um, yeah, no, uh, first of all, I said thanks, thanks for having me, Dave. Um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting chat. I think the first time we met in, uh, in Harrogate that day, that's what, three or four years ago now. But um, yeah. Yeah, in terms of me, like um, my first sporting memory, um, looking back, I had an older brother who who wasn't interested in sport. He was very much into um, NASA trains and maths, uh, which um, kind of come full circle. We'll probably talk more about things like that now. But uh, I was dragged around all your Yorkshire train stations as a kid, MC, Howard, places like that, on these like um, train spotting days and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, my brother. We went to um, America as kids to Orlando, went to the Space Centre and Disneyland and all that. So I was kind of dragged around that way and then just started playing football in the yard at, at school. Um, probably seven, going on eight. I wasn't like a, an early starter as a kid where, as I was born, my dad gave me a football at one years old before I could even walk and stuff like that. So I was never really forced into it. And then um, from chatting and playing football with, with friends at school, um, decided to go to the local the local team, which was Salter for at the time. Um, my dad, which is interesting, probably changed my career path massively straight away. Decided to take me to Barrowford Celtic rather than my own local team, um, which was probably another twenty minute drive away. Barrowford Celtic at the time were probably the best grassroots team in the area in terms of recruitment and. Um, lads that went on and did did really well. So, um, including people like Jay Rodriguez, I think, was in that side at the time, but the older age groups who, who went on to have a great career with Burnley and, and England. Um, but Dad took me down there straight away. So straight away, I had um, two groups of friends. So I had my school friends, and then I had like football friends, for want of a better, a better term. But um, kind of grew from there. From a young age, eight and nine, I was being scouted by... Burnley, Blackburn, Man United, kind of did the rounds and then ended up back at back at Burnley um, as an 11 or 12 year old. But I was, I was playing up and probably from the age of 12 to 15, really kind of progressed as a footballer. Um, was there any football then, in your family, Lewis? Or did your dad play football uh, or what was... My dad, my dad played grassroots. Um, my dad's a joiner, self-employed joiner. So, like in terms of other things around like life skills, I've learnt, learnt loads from him. Um, got a, like a distant uncle, Tommy Craig, who played for Newcastle, managed and assistant managed up in Scotland, but never really had like contact with him because I think like as a family, it was never one of them where I'm going to ring him for a trial because I genuinely don't really know him that well. But obviously, he's a, he's a family member and. Um, that that link's never really really been made, um, and that was probably the only kind of football link within the family. Like I said, my brother's route was different. Um, mum mum's side of the family not really. Like I said, wasn't really a football footballing family. So that's that's probably an interesting point to kind of get across. And then, like I said, I progressed through the system at, at Burnley as a kid. Did really well at 15 years old. Ended up playing. Um, 
got an international cap for Scotland in the um, in the Victory Shield. Obviously, with my dad being being Scottish, um, then signed a scholarship at, at sixteen. Um, from there, went into like a, a, a sports team. Probably spoke, speak a little bit more about this later on. Of found the sixteen to eighteen youth team period very tough in my life as a footballer uh, going from obviously doing really well to then having that kind of first struggle in my career. Let me jump in there Lewis you've kind of opened the door tell us a little bit about that time you know when that sort of 16 to 18 period which you found tough what, what was tough about it? Um, personally like I said um, was never not, not a rich family or a well-off family or like fed from the silver spoon kind of thing, but I was always had a structure in my life in terms of mum was a housewife, so every day food was on the table at five. Um, dad worked every hour under the sun, and obviously speaking more to my dad now as an adult and finding out like the hours he had to work when me and my brother were younger to kind of buy a house and grow a business and and then obviously um, provide for us uh, while we'd taken that decision from mum not to work. Um, there's like I said, there's the pros and cons to it of you've got a structure at home, you've always mm. got food on the table, and you've always you're always being looked after. Mm. But there's never that unstructured kind of thing, and that's through no fault of anyone. Mum and dad just wanted to provide for me, and then obviously going into 18s football, move away from home, made the conscious decision I wanted to move away from home because I wanted to have that kind of independent lifestyle. Um, but then obviously having to deal with lads that you lived with. Um, you know, there's different characters, which was interesting. Going into an environment where, um, so to kind of give you a bit of an idea, when we were 15 and 16 at Burnley, we were probably unbeaten, or well, more or less unbeaten for two, one or two years as a team. So you can imagine that team going into the youth team set up thinking, right, we're playing against the same players basically that we've been playing against for four, five, six years at New Preston's and Oldham's and Berries and Rochdale. Yeah. First game of the season, we were, I think, we were 1 0 up with two minutes left, lost 2 1. And the, the scene in the change rooms at the end of the game was something I'd never seen before because obviously, you're now suddenly three point football, it means something a little bit more. Yes, there's still development in it, but then to be able to be like um, shouted at differently by a manager, by a coach, and, and all that kind of stuff, it, we went on a 10 game losing streak at the start of the season and you think this is potentially one of the best teams in the North West um, and that was that was a real struggle and I, I found myself kind of in and out of the team and um, went from probably a very naturally gifted left footer in terms of my ability as a footballer to questioning my strengths um, which I found really really tough to kind of get over and like I said on, on reflection was that down to me was that down to a coach I'm not too sure, but I personally think I could have been mentally mentally stronger for that two-year period. And and was it solely then, do you think, the, the loss or was it a culmination of a number of things, do you think? What was eating away at your mental strength then? I think I think the environment and genuinely, like we said, going back down to my upbringing, yeah. never really having to deal with them things until 17, 18. And then right. suddenly you're thrown into this this um, this kind of scenario and it's go and deal with it whereas like I, you hear things about someone's had potentially like a, a death or a trauma in their life as a yeah. youngster that makes them stronger and more resilient earlier yeah. that probably came later in my life um, so like I said school I found easy football I did well at um, and naturally like a pretty bright at school um, never really had any kind of issues to deal with as a lad I kind of was always into football so it wasn't as if I was out on the streets and then I'm way. hearing at 16 and 17 you've got this place where you've got to start really looking after yourself the trials and tribulations of getting on with other people progressing where football gets a little bit harder was it, is that the environment that you're kind of talking about yeah um, I think the digs one was an interesting one because like live with different lads and straight away you're living with potential lad who's from inner city Manchester or inner city Liverpool and their life's totally different to what mine's been. Um, they might have had a little bit of a rougher upbringing or something's happened in their life and they could be very difficult in certain situations, but they backed themselves and they had that probably, that little bit more of like a self-esteem and a self-confidence as 
as a player through through obviously the, the things they've gone through in their lives. Like I said, I live with lads from Manchester, lads from Liverpool who who'd seen things in their lives that I probably never, never even seen. thought of. Wow. Kind of a really impactful <laughs> time of your career there, actually. Yeah, and like at the time it's you don't really think about it. It's like you're just thinking, I want to be in the team on Saturday. I want to get better as a footballer. I want to get a professional contract. Um, but it kind of, what I did after the first year as, a, as an apprentice at Burnley was I got offered the chance to go to America for the summer. So rather than have an off-season, um, a friend of a friend of my dad's was working in America with a, like a, an amateur club. And he just said, he came and met me and he said, come out. If um, if you want to train, train. If you want to coach, coach. If you just want to come out for four weeks and do nothing, do nothing. Right. And I went out and probably trained harder than I'd ever trained. Kept myself fit. Enjoyed it. It was another chance of seeing somewhere else. And it kind of got my name out there in America around potential clubs and stuff in the future. And then came back and had the same again. So I came back to pre-season. Um, was the fittest in the team by a mile. Um, had a great pre-season, and then it got to the first game of the season. I wasn't even in the squad. You know, you, you've been through a really um, difficult period there, you know, when you're 16, 17, it's your kind of key years of your life where you're sort of growing up, finding out who you are. You had quite a tough time. And obviously, you found a, you found a way out, by the sounds of it, by going to America. But I'm kind of curious as to what, what did you call on? You know, in looking back at what happened to you, what was the resources you pulled on? How did you navigate yourself through that to come out of it in a positive way? Um, it actually, it didn't really hit home till I got released um, as a second year scholar, obviously not offered a professional contract. I think like going back to um, the end of the pre-season, so we played the first league game this evening at Berry. I'll never forget it. Um, wasn't in the squad. We lost 4-3 on the day. And, there was a little part of me that was, which has probably crossed a lot of footballers' minds, and especially lads in, in academy systems. Of, I was kind of happy with Moss in a way, because obviously I wasn't in the team. You start to become a little bit more selfish, and I thought, is that is that a little bit of a, a change in me? Um, but then it kind of hit home when, like I said, fast forward nine or ten months to April, May time, when we get like your decision meetings, and... I sat in mind with uh, Terry Pashley and Vince Overson. And Vince Overson, to say, had seen my development from 11 or 12 all the way through. And he'd been, been a big, big factor, but probably a bit more from a distance as, as a, a youth team player, whereas uh, Terry Pashley was like the one that was with me every day. And um, I got released, devastated, kind, kind of, like I said, kind of knew it was, it was coming because of not playing all season, really, and not being involved and not, not reaching my potential over the two years. Um, but in the same meeting as being released, I was offered the opportunity to coach within the pre-academy because Vince basically turned around to me and said, like, you, you've been released, but we cannot fault you for the first one in, your last one away. You work, you work hard and you sacrifice so much and throw it into football. And even when you've not been selected in teams, you're still coming on Monday and you're ready to train. and. And that kind of hit home. It was like, I didn't really realise it, but probably from the age of 13 or 14 to 18, I'd thrown my whole life into football. Right. And, but I didn't regret it because I'd got a bit of a reward out of it. Um, obviously, the coaching kind of, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. It's a little bit of kind of money on a Friday for coaching under sevens and under eights. But I, I still mean, obviously wanted to pursue football. But I'm hearing there that the, re the reward was that you had an opportunity to go into coaching. And what was yeah. that like for you? Can you recall that back then in terms of, you know, your dream and you'd given your whole life to wanting to go into being a professional footballer and then being offered something that wasn't really on your agenda? Yeah, no, it's, um, it was like, it was an, it, in a way, it was a bit of a nice meeting because it kind of reaffirmed right. that someone had noticed the hard work I was, I was right. putting in as a player. It was just like you, you go through that period and like I've recently spoke to some of our lads obviously working in the job I do, but the you can have a little bit of hatred towards the person that releases you, which is natural. I think it's if you get sacked from a job or whatever. I think if someone says 
gotten your natural reaction is to kind of buy it back. So probably from 18 to 21, kind of didn't really have a lot of time for this person that had, that had released me um, and had that, that bit of resentment and then you get to 21, 22 and I think from 18 to 21 playing kind of non-league football and doing the rounds and going on trials at places and and doing that kind of stuff developed a bit of a the game mentality which I never had which obviously was trying to be instilled in me as a, as a younger player where having a bit of an arrogance on a football pitch and being it like I was always, always going to back it up because of how hard I worked but um, you've got to have that arrogance that self-esteem that self-belief that like when you go on a football pitch or you go into any any environment that you have you've got to be able to back yourself and probably like going up to me now not just having that bit of confidence in, you, in your own ability and backing yourself like I did as a coach as I do now if I had these traits now um, when I was 16, 18 not saying I'd have got a professional contract but I'd have been a lot closer to potentially having one I'm really curious again you know there's, there's as you know better than I do because of the job that you do that there are a lot of people out there um, in the kind of the academy system between the ages of you know seven or eight or whatever right the way through to you know 18 19 20 all desire a career in football and are striving for it and as we both know there is um you know there's not that many places it's a competitive place to be and given your story what kind of advice would you give to people or how, how do you think they should navigate it um i wrote also be down last night when i was kind of thinking about this and i put a big thing around advice for me personally would be like cling on to the correct people and kind of as you go along your journey. Like I, I did a presentation on a course I was on when I met you, Dave, and um, it was one of my one of my slides. I did it in pictures. Was like pictures of people that had kind of had a positive effect on me, and you actually end up going back to a course that you had when you were twelve or someone you met in a job when you were 21 and I just that that thing of cling cling on to people of um whether it's they give you you know to give that little bit of self-esteem um manage your own manage your own personal development as well so when you walk into uni like like I did and one of the uh um the the units in your first and second year at uni is like personal development and a lot of students kind of laugh at it and go, oh, "This is the one where I'm gonna I'm gonna miss this lesson today because it doesn't mean anything." And I was thrown. I remember sat with my first uni lecture, and I had no interest in uni the first year I was there. My mum dragged me, uh, made me do it, and she 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 always um, stressed that like I was bright and I need to need to pursue it. And it took me to get an injury in my second year of uni to actually get my head down and go. I can actually learn some, some really good stuff here and new stuff that's happened to me. But that lecture I had in the first year, he was throwing Jahari's window at me and uh, <laughs> all these other models. And I'm thinking, this is, this is a load of rubbish. And then four or five years later, I'm picking up going, wow, that's, I, need, I need to do this. I need, I need to use that because where I'm working at the minute, I need to be as self-aware as possible. I also think there's a there's a I think obviously when you get older as well there's a there's a, a place where you love to have that little bit of naivety sometimes as well. So you don't want to be too self aware and too you can end up kind of say spiraling into like a bit of a black hole of like you kind of always know what your emotions are, you always know how you're gonna to react to something. I've had times in the last couple of years as a coach where I've I've known what emotion I'm feeling or whatever and just not being able to get out of it and kind of like I don't really want to know I want to just like enjoy the moment and see where it kind of it kind of takes you um but yeah going back to like I said I think the, the biggest one was in terms of the advice was like I said cling on to the correct the correct people um, and how, and how how do you do that then Lewis how, how did you do that who's correct uh, stu a stupid probably little analogy was two or three years ago there was probably about 12 or 14 mates we had a night out it was someone's birthday um, might have even been my birthday and there was a lad that I used to work with at Burnley and he was out and he's someone who I've always kept in touch with since meeting him at Burnley and, and leaving and we were just having a beer and 
he turned around to me and said, like, there's no idiots here. I go, what do you mean? He goes, like, everyone who's out tonight wants to be here and, like, everyone's getting on with each other and kind of share the same values and ideas. I said, because he said, they'll go out with a group of mates who he knows, and he said, there's always two or three in that group that, like, you probably look at and think, oh, he's an idiot, or he's, he's doing so much cheaper on a night out. I said, this, this group was like, everyone, even though some had never met each other before. Um, and that probably sparked me to think about it a little bit and go, right, let's, let's, how have I kind of created this little group around me? And like I said, going back to the other bit about per, uh, manage your own personal development, I make a point of speaking to people that I think are going to um, help me and um, help me progress in my career or in my kind of lifestyle. So um, I've cut people off. Um, and that's where you've got to have that little bit of a ruthless attitude sometimes. But I think the ones that you want to really keep close, you you, you make a, a conscious effort of keeping in touch with people. And you, you know, whether it's just a tech. You make me smile a little bit because I think there's a, a lovely saying, isn't there? You are the sum of the three people you spend the most time with. And, you know, so it's there is something about who you surround yourself with and who you spend time with. Um, you know, and I think there's a, that's a lovely story because I think for, for young people coming through a, a development pathway, wanting to aspire to be whatever, whether it be a footballer or, a, you know, a, or an entrepreneur or a, just a great educator, whatever, there is something about the people you, you gravitate to and you spend time with, you know, which you, you, you've obviously either learnt by default or you knew what you were doing. And, and I'm just kind of, again, quite curious as what a guidance could we give to the young people that might be engaging in this about how do they know who to spend the time with how do they know who to surround themselves with and how do we how might we inform them what would you say to some of the academy players that you work with now i think um i think you've you've got to know a lot about yourself first yeah. and what like and what make, what makes you tick um like my mine probably for the last 10, 11 years has been very, very career driven because I've made a, a conscious effort to throw myself into this and, and get as high a level as I can. But on reflection recently and thinking about, uh, thinking about, I've actually, two of my best friends aren't even involved in sport. And it's, I find that as an unbelievable kind of tool to speak to them on a different kind of aspect of life. And and that's, that's probably taken a lot of work because I think even yourself, Dave, when you met me three or four years ago, you were like, he's, he's kind of really intense and he's, he's in here. I think as you get older, you learn to, I think I, think I can sometimes have kind of two personalities. Mm -hmm. of, I can maybe be a little bit standoffish sometimes when I meet someone for the first time, um, when I find a link or I understand that their values maybe match mine, then I'm in. I'm, I'm, kind, I'm kind of all in. Um, but if I, I work out quickly that um, you're not worth my time, like it's, it's not being horrible, it's not being, it's just you've got to, like you said for me, surround yourself with with them them people that that are going to benefit you the most. And that I've it's took me longer to work out some people sometimes where I've maybe worked with someone or it's been a friend, and then the two the two way conversations are a great one to kind of. Uh, judge for me if if you're the one that's always instigating a conversation with someone or it's always you that has to chase them up then and you don't kind of get reciprocated it's I think that kind of gives you an answer sometimes um, unless obviously you think it's beneficial that you need to work on that a little bit more you're playing out for me brilliantly though in terms of actually the importance of your values you know the time I've known you the importance of how your values underpin the work you do how you do it what's important to you you know, you've got a very strong work ethic, which has been played out. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm putting two and two together here, but and maybe making five, but I don't think I am in terms of, you know, you mentioned your dad had to start really hard and grow a business and work hard at it and to provide for you, which he did, you know, and I, I think that sort of played through. And I, I'm, I'm really curious again, as how that was playing out in your life. Now I'm hearing it, um, play out in terms of the um, the work you're putting into driving yourself or you, you kind of use the term I throw myself into this how do you um, then relay that onto the people you work with um like that, that like I said sometimes it can challenge your values and it's a listen it was interesting to listen to Eddie Jones say something yeah. similar the other day about they were talking about his staff and 
like I, I've consciously chose to, to do this with my career. Some people are happy to go to work nine to five in a sports job, go home, they've got a family. Brilliant. That's, and then I've probably I've got to have a little bit more of like empathy with that at times. Um, but yeah, like sharing the same values with me, I think going back to even like, my, not just my dad, my mum as well, um, kind of, it was very difficult to get praise. Um, and I think that rubbed off on me massively in terms of when I work with players. I work, I work with a player day in, day out. And right. um, there's examples probably later on in, in the interview of like certain times when I work with with players and athletes. But um, I think you've got to earn that kind of well done. Or I can be kind of a little bit blunt with a player for a little bit, but I want them to understand that they've earned that when they get a well done or a pat on the back. How do people earn praise from you? Um, if, if, if you see them, like I said, I think you've got to give them a little bit of sugar sometimes. I think it's a great, uh, my boss, Jamie Russell, uses it a lot in terms of give players a little bit of sugar. So uh, now and again, keep them going. Because like I said, we, lads, lad players, they're, they're different now. Um, in terms of like, I, I could work, like I said, from 13 to 16 years old. I was kicking a ball against the wall outside my mum and dad's house every night. No one told me to go and do it. Yeah. I did it. It's well, now you have to give them a little bit of encouragement, but I still try and um, promote them like really, really old school values of kind of working hard without without any real praise and having that kind of self-regulated mentality. But obviously we new methods at times and different ways of working, working with players. Um, but it's... It's something I've not got right yet. Like it's, <laughs> I'm like a very, very strong in my values, and it's, I can get frustrated with with players at times, um, because even though a player might be really good for our youth team, why can't he be striving to be at Barcelona's level or Real Madrid's level? And so you think you work hard, but look at this, and and I think um, that's a skill. Obviously, find get getting someone to to really want to be like self self motivated, mm-hmm. um, but like it comes from a lot of things. Your upbringing, yeah. um, what's going on in your life, um, and like it, it it just comes from my upbringing. It's not going to change me because like in in the past with with parents and things, I wasn't given given stuff. Uh, I was provided for also food on the table, but that the the essentials I had, but the materialistic stuff. It was well, go on graft for this if you really want it. Go on, earn a way of making it. For me, Lewis, you know you're <clears throat> you've got a, a really unique position because you're actually uh, um, you moved from Burnley into working at at Salford City. Um, and started an academy really from scratch. It was a blank sheet of paper. So, you know, there's not many places where you can really put your own stamp on it yourself and Jamie, as you mentioned before, and, and grow this through. You've been going at it, what, three years or so now, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I've just, just finished the third season now. The, the third season. I'm hearing very strongly your, your values and I'm hearing the kind of the tension between actually your values that um, have really driven a performance environment or you in, in your performance journey you're actually the generation of young people that you're working with um i haven't got some of those old school values or require a different way of motivating so i'm just wondering you know how do you play out that at salford how do you work there to actually give them what they want but also maintain who you are i think um i think they've got them things in them it's obviously right. just finding a way of getting them out great uh, it's a great one for us as a Category 4 club where we have no under-9s to 16s where we're recruiting boys that are released from the club at 16. So they've already straight away got that little bit of fire of I want to prove someone wrong, which helps. That doesn't always stay for the two years. Some lads, when they actually come in and realise that football day in, day out and prehab and stretching and drinking protein shakes and running and it's not for them. It just genuinely isn't. I think that's where you... you start to see a little bit of a difference but then you start working with the ones that really really want it and you're pushing them and, and getting more out of them I think we work through like a, an MDT process and something we identify as early as we can is 
um, which staff kind of work best with some which players. So at the minute, like potentially lads who share the same values as me, or kind of have that that in inner, inner drive to start with, I'll probably um, attract to very quickly and kind of you naturally just work with them. Whereas there might be some a little bit soft, softer at times. You need an arm round them and things like that. Where you might identify that he has a better relationship with another coach or a physio or an S and C, and you kind of try and use that method to get your way in. Because um, my role has probably changed over the last eighteen months, where I've gone from really supporting Jamie in the running of the academy, so I'm yeah. like the lead eighteens coach now. So when it comes to picking a team or um, putting a session on or driving a session, sometimes I, I, I'm probably become the least approachable one because going from my experiences if I get dropped by a certain coach I don't really like that person for an hour two hours two days whatever so I probably want to mourn or win to someone else so I don't get the opportunity sometimes to talk to these players if I think it's crucial I'll speak to some one-to-one um, but then understanding that your other coaches can pick up them pieces at times while you're obviously working on, on something different, everyone's got different roles. Um, we have a psychologist, obviously, that helps with that at the minute. But it's, it's interesting because I've, it's, it's been a tough one for me because I, I like the relationships with players. Yeah. And some players this year who've had me for the first time probably think it could be a little bit harsh or it can push you really hard at times. But the Lewis four or five years ago when I was working with the under-16s at Burnley or the under-9s at Burnley, was a different coach and I think I've I was more that I'm not the decision maker so I was like I'm the one with the arm around you I'm, I'm your best friend in the session I'm helping you I'm staying and doing extra but I think when you become that lead coach it's and I think I think a lot of people go through it where they go I really enjoy these really personal relationships but then it becomes compromised when I'm picking a youth cup team when we turn around and go like this is a game where as a club, we want to win because it's our show keys game. So, Lewis, how do you then manage that? Because, you know, again, there might be lots of grassroots coaches out there, whether it be in football or any sport, and they're all similar to you or in a sense of, you know, relationships are really key. Um, and, you know, as we've got to know each other, what's become really powerful, and, and it's one of my key philosophies, is actually the power of a relationship is, is what makes a good coaching relationship but yet when you when you throw in the ingredient of selection and therefore how that might break it how do you manage holding on to that relationship as best you can because clearly you've got to make selection decisions um, and I'm wondering again what guidance we give or how do you package it in your head or how do you set it up in your mind that you can maintain that relationship with the individual player I'm probably still young in this in terms I'm still playing around with ideas so I might pull a player before a session and go, you're not going to be playing tomorrow or speak to him after or speak to him a couple of days after or uh, sometimes you might go through the parent because I think there might be an underlying issue in terms of like his form and kind of helping him that way. Um, but like I said, it's that, that bank of staff that Jamie's kind of put together that I'd say that there's each member of staff's got their value to at least two or three players in the group and obviously passing that that message on. Um, I think me as a personal development thing has probably got to be a little bit more open with that sometimes because uh, I envy sometimes the staff that get the chance to kind of be the mates with the players and miss that because probably the, the, the best two jobs I had before Salford were I had the under-16s at Burnley for two years, which is the best group of players I've ever worked with as, as lads and as a team. To, uh, ability wise it was it was frightening and I was on my own with that group for 18 months and kind of had to pick up every role so it was exhausting at some point but to another point I've learned that's how I work with him that's how I work with him that's how I work with him and then the same when I had the the women's job at Burnley College for four years where I was basically everything from running the academy side to um, S&C coach so I had to go across the spectrum of everything I made so many mistakes like <laughs> different conversation with, with girls and players around why they're playing why they're not playing how to get the most out of them in college before even kicking the football um, organising tours and trips to Sweden it's 
But I think, like I said, my big thing for the last two years was um, I played like a two-year period where I wasn't on a course. And I kind of thought, it's great that you have all this knowledge. You read, you do courses, you listen to podcasts and stuff on social media, everything. But at what point do you actually go, there's all these millions and millions of ideas in head of like um, integrated coaches and multidisciplinary coaching styles, everything. When do you actually go, right, I'm going to have a year of, I'm going to coach, I'm going to experiment with this stuff and I'm going to see what works for me, what doesn't work for me. And I think coaching's kind of done that full circle now that it's gone. Stuff around coaching styles is now loads of remakes, right? Everyone has to do like games-based approach to now it's, no, you do what suits that moment to you in this that in that time, and I think that's the big one now. Um, I love being on courses. I love the education side of, of coaching, but I think when you actually go right, I'm going to implement this stuff. What I'm hearing is you've come to a, a recognition that actually experimenting and and trying things out and making mistakes and getting it right and getting it wrong is also learning. Yeah, you you can like I said, you can you can get yourself into like. Like I said, spiral is the amount of coaching where you could put two sessions on, think, oh, they're great. And then you speak to someone who goes, oh, I do it this way. And then because they're really high up in sport, you go, oh, I've got to change everything again. And I think, like, we'll, we'll probably speak about it more in a bit, but when I first met you that day, I think the amount of things going on in my head was, I was ready to pack it all in, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's change gear and go towards, you know, a one particular highlight of your career so far what's the, the standout that's really landed and you think wow this is really dropping into place and it's uh, something you're most proud of it's a little moment to be fair um, i was um i was coaching the under 16s at burn at the time like i said previously like yeah. as a group i just loved it like turn up to sessions and I never had to manage the group in terms of like a tempo or um, the discipline side or anything. I think that's something really something to hold on to. Which at the time I was just going along with it. I was a young coach. I'd been given this group. I'm thinking I'm actually really lucky to get this group. Um, and we <laughs> we went from the 15 season to 16 season. 16 season we were absolutely flying. Obviously these lads are getting potentially offered contracts at the end of the season. And I know it's not about kind of results, but in terms of the performances, they were outstanding. And we went to Preston, I remember, at the UConn Sports Arena one day, and it was obviously a Sunday morning. Played the game, and we've lost either 7-1 or 7-0. I can't remember the result. We've lost. I've been absolutely annihilated. And I'm on the side, well, to be fair, I'm on the side of it. I didn't really know what to do. Tactically, I wasn't great at the time. In terms of my knowledge, how to change things. Looking across at probably 16 coaches at Preston who've been in the game for 20 years and <laughs> just got, got outdone physically, mentally, tactically, every, everything you think of. And I walked, there's like a little bit of a walk from Preston's kind of show pitch back to the little change rooms near the 3G. And I'm walking back and I walked past a couple of parents. And like I said, as that young coach at the time, I was, I'd always talk to parents. I'd end up at a game for three hours after talking to parents. I was walking back to the change rooms and, uh, and same again, I was, I was there on my own that day and a couple of parents made a couple of comments going, oh, are you, are you going to give them a bollock in now? So I walked back and I thought, on the way back, I'm thinking, like, what am I going to say to these lads? I've just lost 7 nil, but for 12 months, they've been phenomenal, like unbelievable, unbelievable for me. Um, so I, got, I, walked, I walked into the changing room and it was just silence. Pure silence, like not. A, and there, there were some characters in that group, and I just literally said to lads, I went, "The only, um, the only thing that would have bettered this for me is if a couple of you would have been fighting." And it was just, just something I thought. I love the fact that they were they were gutted about the result and they were annoyed with the performance. But the next level for me in terms of them at that time was. A leadership of like because you hear about obviously rugby dressing rooms, football dressing rooms, fights go off like it's part it's part of the game because people have a desire to win. And I just shut the door straight out. Lads went home, shut people down. It's gone. The Tuesday, I think we train on the Tuesday. Um, it's the best session I've ever coached in my life. 
and I hardly had to do anything. The reaction of that group of players that night, um, and they always they already always trained at a good level. The tempo went up. Um, they were giving it to each other. The demands on each other. And I just finished the session. I thought, wow, because I got obviously the message off the academy manager on the Sunday after he was all like, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And you kind of having to justify why you've lost seven minutes. But then the grand scheme of things, it's one game out of how many in development football at the end of it. Forget like the seven nil, the performance was horrendous anyway. But on the Tuesday the session, like there's people walking past, like coaches who were coming to coach area going, what's happened to these tonight? What are you saying? I'm like, I'm literally stood on the sidelines, not having to say a word. And these lads just ran the session. And session finished, and the usual happened. They picked up all the gear. The mannequins were put away neatly. All that kind of stuff. So all them little stupid values that some people don't take, like, don't really kind of look at, um, it was all the same. And then it was kind of, it was kind of forgotten about. And I just thought, whether... I'm not saying it was for me, but did I manage that the right way by that dressing room? I could have gone in, screamed out for half an hour. Why didn't you go in and scream? Or what guided you to do what you did? This is not just a simple story. This is a real illustration of many things in terms of the culture and the environment that the team was in and what you created. And clearly you played a big part in that. And I'm just curious, again, for those listening, what did you do and why did you do it in that way? I think there was a massive element of trust. I think, like I said, could I have gone in, gone in a, a different approach? Yeah, and maybe got the same reaction. Yeah, but um, I think my my personal feeling at the time, whether it be naive as a coach, you all thought I don't need to um, build was this it, much trust over. Was it naive as a coach? Um, was it clever? I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, that's just it was just my my feelings at the time, like I said, whether I acted on them rightly or wrong. And I think, like I said, that that trust in the group had, had built up. I think, and that's a difficult thing, probably going away from this like to recreate. Of it was kind of me and the players, whereas obviously when you become more staff, and this is the thing, obviously with big organisations, is how do you keep that kind of cultural cultural thing going? Um, so, Lewis, if we take that forward, you know, this is. A, a, a great experience and you've highlighted it as actually a really impactful time in your career and the part that you played in actually not doing what maybe many might have expected you to have done which is to give them a, a good telling off let them work its way out i.e sort of learn through the process do you think you do the same now with your players at Salford um no I think like it's, it's different I think I've got First, I think I've got a range of skills now in terms of obviously, but then it's playing around with them and picking the right ones at the right time. So I've had the the challenge has been different this year, where we've had a, a very good youth team again, but built on probably something a bit more. The fact that these lads have been released from clubs, they're not the best players around. They are the demands we've put on them every day, and we've kind of not shirked away from the demands and gone. If you want to get to a level, a high level, we're going to have to drag some of you there because it's all well and good sometimes talking about, um, like I said, games-based stuff and leaving lads to their own devices. Sometimes you can't do it for too long, especially if you've only got them for two years. So we've, like, we're going to get you to a level and then once you hit a certain standard or um, you can, you've got a certain skill skill set, technically, tactically, psychologically, physically, then we start playing around with the stuff and going, right, I can let you try something there or you can think of a suggestion there and that, that's how we're going to take it. And the big thing this year was with me, is like I probably took it from Guardiola, was he said something about when you're winning all the time, because we went on a really good kind of winning run this season, yeah. when you're winning all the time, it's the best time to coach because the players' morale's high, they're confident you've always got to try and pull them down a little bit to keep them grounded. So half-time team talks, end-of-game team talks, the session on the Monday after winning, the sessions rather, were always like adding a little bit more. It was never walk into a change room and go, lads, just do what you did last week or same again today. And 
I think a couple of staff tried to kind of test me with that a couple of times. I think like because Jamie, like my boss, is he's really clever with stuff like that. He, he tried it a couple of times, and I've gone, no, no, I want to challenge him again and again. Mm. And then the Guardiola thing of like you manage them psychologically when they get beat. Um, there's a couple of times that you go, you've got to give them a little bit of a cheer. Uh, but like I said, these lads are in a different level to that group of lads that I had at Burnley. That was a, a special group in terms of mentality and ability and they're all kind of on a similar level. Whereas what we've done at Salford, we're taking like a lot of rejects from places and going, let's mould these and build them in the, in the light of the club and what, what the club would like the values to look like. From our conversations, what's come through really clear here is your ability to flex your approach and style and the requirements that you've had to do that. So given the environment that Burnley is with players that are really striving and at the top of their game and have been identified and recruited in, whereas in Salford, you say these are players that have been released from other clubs. So their experience of performance pathway has been different um, and therefore your approach has had to change. Is that fair to say? You know, Has it really grown you as a coach to learn how to adapt the way you approach your coaching? Yeah, definitely. Like I had an appraisal with Jamie last, last year and he, he come out and watch one of the sessions and he said, oh, I love that because they were doing a session and the level was not good enough and I just basically stopped the session and started it again. And Jamie was like, sometimes they just need that. The, the natural, like they can naturally drift into that, that mode. So it's, like I said, it's getting to that level where you understand it. I think, how it kind of works with us at Salford a lot of time is the first year they find very, very tough um, in terms of the stuff we throw at and the ideas getting used to us, we getting used to them, their buying, our buying to them. And then the second year, it's like, how are we going to run with this? Where are you going to take this to? Um, I think that's that's kind of the model we've used. I think you've, you've really played out again the thought process of actually yes your players might dif- be different and have different experiences but what are performance standards you know whether you're creating an, a category one academy at Burnley or whether you're developing academy from scratch at Salford do you water your standards down do you water your approach is your culture still important you know you've talked quite a lot about the importance of trust in your group uh, do you think those things are as equally important and how do you bring those in our, our culture is huge it, it can only be in terms of myself and others as staff, we can only be um, produced by how, how we work. Yeah. Uh, and obviously we've got the gaffer above us, who, he's, he's been brilliant with me as well, Graham Alexander, um, and the, even the managers before that, in terms of Burn and John, the, the work ethic is, is unbelievable. Um, and it was probably one of, the, one of the nice things I heard in a one-to-one this year with a player, one who's actually been released recently just asked about doing his review and he sat down psychologically psychologically was like uh, want to get up to the standards of of yourself as a, as a coach and uh, kind of get inspired by the fact that when the, when I walk in in the morning at eight I've seen that you as a coach have been here since half six or seven and you're and you're already working which promotes that straight away because like this going that probably again going back to these old school values where it's yeah, yeah. a lot more still now around flexible hours and you don't have to be in at seven and stuff like that. But I, I believe personally, like it, it just sets, sets a good standard straight away. And you're kind of asking lads to do stuff that you're not asking them to do anything that you're not, not doing. And Lewis, how coming into a, a, an academy like Salford, which, you know, has high profile owners to the club, did that impact on you at all? Or does that add a weight of expectation or, or and or how has their influence dripped down through the club into what you do? To be honest, like in terms of, I don't feel any kind of pressure from the top. The only pressure is probably myself and our kind of little unit of, of staff at work. But um, I was sold on it the minute Jamie rang me. I was probably, Jamie rang me when I was at Burnley going, would you like to come and help me at Salford? And when he'd left Everton and I kind of, on the phone, I said, I'll, I'll get back to you. But I knew, I just made it, I was like, tried to play it cool a bit I think I, I rang a couple of people rang my dad had to explain it to my dad because my dad was a bit like Burnley <laughs> to National League North and I said no no this is like the job that I wanted and uh, yeah and then a other couple of people like yeah no it's it's a great one for you but we kind of sat down at the start and 
we've not given this document that had been produced by obviously Gary Neville, the owners, and it was very much um, based around their values. They talk about relentlessness, being organised, good leaders, and stuff like that, um, good discipline. So we had we we started running with this, and I said to Jim, "Well, why don't we just build it based on these these five five key words?" Um, so we started putting things together, and we were kind of going to Chris Casper and, and Gary going, do you like this, do you like this? And then they got, I think they got to a stage where they went, lads, you don't need to come and ask us every five minutes. We've got you in because we believe you can build something in our, um, in line with our, yeah, our, spirit, our spirit and our aim. So they left us to it and then kind of like, we, we ran with it. And uh, it's easier. I can, like I said, I've from looking now back at, when I was at Burnley, there was transitions at times in the academy managing, heads of coaching and other jobs I've been in as well, lower down. I can imagine it's tough for someone to come in and try and change or mould mold values and how do you, this outside of someone, get everyone working on the side. That's, that's a, an unbelievable person with unbelievable personal skills that can go and do that, especially as like an academy manager coming in at Burnley or any Premier League club because you're not coming in at the top and running everything because you've still got the manager, the chief exec, people above you. And where does that, that kind of fit? Where, like I said, we, from the start, we're like, right, we're going to build it, build it on this. And I'm, like I said, come down to putting a session together or like picking a team. If it's, if it's a toss-up between potentially, say, two players for a starting place in the, in the Youth Cup, you probably come back to these values and go, which one's going to put? represented in the best light on on this night in the so, game so just to sort of narrow us down a little here i'm just uh, what would be your two or three non-negotiables you know in terms of we've talked values here quite a lot but what are the key principles or values that somebody would need to bring into the environment if they were to work with you and there might be those of salford but i'm guessing i'm asking you what are your personal key three or four key principles or values to be successful in your environment um, for for hard work, hard work. straight away, it's it's um, and it's pick like picking up on people that do work hard or pretend to work hard, and it's the more knowledge, like the, the more experience you get, you kind of you, you see it, and it's good because I I chat to the, the gaffer about a couple of these things sometimes, and he probably picks up on more things than me um, when I've kind of dropped it in. Um, Hard work, self regulation is a massive one. If I can, if I see a lad who can, or a player who can, can manage himself and work, and or if he doesn't know how to ask questions, like I say he's curious to how do I do this, how do I do it? Because a couple of our first years this year have done that really well. They've kind of come in the door, messed about at it for pre season, not really understood it, then suddenly gone, I'm not in the team. What have I got to do to get in the team? It's like, I'll help you, but you've got to be helping yourself as well. Yeah. Because like I said, it's, it's, it's human nature. You've got a 20-man squad. Like I said, I can't always be with you every minute of every day because we've got stuff going on. But how do I know that you're, you're doing this way? Because I'm not going to waste my time. And like I said, again, as a human, if you're trying with a lad and trying and trying and you don't believe he's really caring about what you're trying to do with him, you, you naturally switch off to that person. Um, so I'd say them too. So hard work, self self regulation, um, and then probably going back to like my career, um, some sort of self esteem or self confidence that they believe they're good enough, right. and that's a great one because you kind of you have lads who are really high self esteem that need dragging down a little bit, um, but you don't mind if they back it up with hard work. Um, or vice versa we had a, a lad last year who got a professional contract this year but for the whole of last season the job was making him believe that he belonged in the building which was which was difficult but it, it, that's literally the only thing he needed because um, all the tools were there as a player so wow. I think that's that's not a bad three no no they're really good three and, and as you're talking I'm just reflecting back on our journey you know me getting to know you and, and hearing your story 
Um, and you know what's come through loud and clear just today is you know the fact that you've worked really hard from from a really early age, put the time and energy and effort into it when training, but also it's playing out in the in the job you've done and taken the academy from where it is to to where it's at now. Um, at, at Salford, self regulation I know has also come into you, and I, I know it's particularly challenging when our habits have been changed recently, but reforming new ones. And again, you've also played played to the idea of you know building in my confidence. And you you actually said earlier on about really feeling that I'm a, a I can fill a space and I can be a good coach. And you know that was something which you maybe struggled a little bit with when you were earlier, but actually growing into your own shoes and actually feeling really worthy and confident. But I love your connection between the three of them actually that they all play off each other. That actually hard work and self regulation can build confidence as well, and and vice versa. So. Um, I think they're a great three. Um, what I would like us to do now, though, Lewis, is I'm going to really channel, channel you down because at the end of the show, what I tend to do is, is ask some quick fire questions where um, I'd like you to give some real great tips. Let's keep it short and sharp, um, but some great yeah. tips to, uh, to the listeners because I think hearing your story and the purpose of the Sports Stories podcast is to, to give some insight, to give some guidance, some inspiration, but give some real tangible tips to those that are listening in to how they can navigate a journey, whether it's a career in sport or actually just navigate being involved and enjoying a lifestyle of, of sport. So my first question to you would be, given that I know you're a keen learner, somebody that takes things in, can you recommend uh, three or four books that have really impacted and informed your journey? Yeah, they have probably gone down a little bit of a different route with this. So I've got a, the one I'm reading at the minute, uh, Charles Duhigg, uh, The Power of Habit. Okay. Which makes a really interesting read around how we develop habits and routines and which I think has been a good thing at this this yeah. time. Yeah, brilliant. Um and then the other three probably a little bit left field. So you've got uh, Michael Lewis, Moneyball. Yeah. So obviously the story of the baseball story around um, how they start to use stats. I think it's more the underlying thing of trying something different. And obviously people have probably seen the film. And then the other two are Lance Armstrong's autobiography, uh, It's Not About the Bike, which I read probably 10 years ago before, obviously, the whole kind of drug scandal, but the high, just reading about elite athletes and what kind of they're willing to do to be at the top, if yeah. you take away the, the scandal. And then uh, a really interesting read, which is Michael Leahy, who wrote When Nothing Else Matters, which is a biography about Michael Jordan when he became the... Um, general manager of the Washington Wizards. Yeah. So he went from being like this all star basketball player to being a general manager. And because the team was so poor, how he managed himself in terms of he was losing his head basically because people didn't work as hard as he did. And I thought it was, it was an interesting book. I thought I've dug it out the other day actually. Got four great books <laughs> and with different stories behind. Different. Well, no, great, yeah. really good. Um, given the, the age that we're in as well and the generation you're working with, I'm curious as to what's been the most powerful and useful piece of technology that you call on? Um, as, a, as a coach, I mean, obviously huddle. Huddle where we clip and you, you have the opportunity to, uh, to have conversation with lads when you're not at the training ground and produce, produce clips for them. And they obviously they buy into it as well, which is great. And they start producing videos about themselves or teams and, and little things like that. And then I'm a little bit old school. I'm always up for a good uh, Excel spreadsheet. I think a few people know me as a spreadsheet sometimes for, a few, for producing stats and things like that. Great stuff. Given we work in a performance pathway and in a performance environment, I'm also keen to hear how, how do you prepare yourself to perform at your best both physically and mentally um running's a big one of mine i've kind of got myself back into a good routine of it recently we've obviously been away but it's been hard over the last couple of years with how much work we've been doing to actually get a routine of it so that's in terms of physically the more, the more i run the better i feel and i uh, probably want to get back into kind of racing and stuff at some point and then mentally i put down a couple of things about I feel probably more relaxed um, if I feel like I'm better prepared than anyone else. So if that comes to obviously coaching a session or taking a game or being in a meeting, um, if I've not prepared, then 
I know for a fact I'll feel a little bit maybe anxious or apprehensive, whereas if I've I've really prepared, especially like thinking the game planning and stuff like that, then I can I can stand in the dugout and be like, I'm happy with the work which it's been put in. And it always kinda of, same way, it kinda of comes back back on my intrinsic motivation at the time. Great. A couple more here. Um if you were to win the lottery tomorrow, how would you spend your winnings? I'd have to do something for my family. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of looking after them. Uh, probably get on the property, like in terms of property development, because obviously just make money from, even more money from that. And then just probably work around this, this business idea that I've probably spoke to you about over the last year or so in terms of trying to help help other coaches and develop them as well great i like that purposeful stuff and and again gives a real insight into our values and your values and what's really important to you so thank, thank you for sharing that it's great um we touched on this a bit earlier on but succinctly um what advice would you give to a, a teenage version of yourself um i pull i pull that phrase again that i um, cling on to the correct people I think I was, I was big on that, and that's something that's come up recently. Younger self, um, manage your own personal development. It's it's yours. It's it's kind of no one's going to turn around to you. Oh, we need to develop you today. Um, and like I said, the more you can do that, the better. And then network and travel, which links in with I think I sp- I spoke to quite a few young coaches when I've done like bits of lectures at universities and stuff, and they say about going and doing a bit in America or Australia or whatever, I said, try not to be in, <laughs> excuse me, like, try not to be in a relationship too young, especially with this job. Enjoy the 18 to 25, 26, where you can use your job to get money and work all over. And then obviously look to link in with, with other things. Um, but I think I think it does hold, it's, it's a real kind of novelty one, but I think it, it holds a lot of, uh, a lot of people back. And every person experience I've I was offered jobs abroad at twenty twenty one and decided not to take them, rightly or wrongly, but I was I was in a relationship in this country which I'm not I'm not in now. So what was the most important thing at the time is that that selfishness at times. There's something about the power of of, of being young and living, you know, when you can yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. No, it's really powerful, good stuff. Uh, and couple more questions then just to finish us off Uh, which three people would you say have been the most impactful people in your career to date apart from my family because straight away i was just going to put my dad and my mum and everything but um the guy called jerry harrison who's become a a massive friend of mine who has taught me not by sitting down and and like teaching me but just by knowing the guys the soft skills of a coach and how to work with people and be better around people and stuff like that. Um, mm. Martin Diggle, who was my first FA tutor, who um, really kind of sparked me as a, a coach, especially around the mod, when I was doing like the mod two and the youth modules around, um, really, really challenged me and got me thinking as a, as a coach. And then I'd probably have to go Jamie Russell, who he was the one that gave me the opportunity, like a platform to go, I want to be an 18s coach. And he went, well, there you go and then especially in the last 18 months he's taken a lot of other work away from me to go go on go on perfect your profession or try and get to perfection because that's what you're striving for sometimes yeah you've kind of opened the door there and you've walked through it though haven't you taken the yeah. opportunity but like i said there was other people like obviously there was like yourself there was your brian ashton's um gareth morgan um there's a ton of people that like i said um they're good people that and helped me with the coaching. And it's lovely to hear that there's a, a, a raft of different people that you've called on. And I think it really echoes back to your, your kind of mantra or your motto about actually, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people and the good people and clinging on to them and using them. So I think you're, you're, you're being quite sort of doing what you say you do, you know, and I think it's lovely yeah. to hear that you're actually trying to live out those values in a, in a purposeful way and in a really respectful way. So that's uh, really powerful stuff. And, and Lewis, you know, you've shared your story here. You've shared some of the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs, um, given a little bit of insight into who you are and your key values, which I think is really powerful. 
and, and as I've always said along the way, you know, it's, um, I, I think everybody's got a, a powerful story and there'll be many people I hope will just cling on to one or two things maybe from your journey and that can impact on theirs. Uh, and with that in mind, whose story would you like to hear? Whose sports story would impact you or you'd be curious about where you feel you might be able to get something from? I wrote three people down. Well, I'm, <laughs> going to, I'm going to just choose one. Right. And I'm going to go Michael Phelps. Ooh. And I just, just something about individual sport, like, um, really gets me thinking. So no disrespect to, to swimmers or anything like that, but to be able to just get in a pool seven days a week and just swim backwards and forwards and back, but to a level that every, and you're not, like I said, you're competing to, you're, well, you're training to compete every four years, really, for the, the medal that you really want. Uh, and to be able to do that time after time after time, I just think it'd be an unbelievable conversation. You're like, what gets you in the pool every day? And what keeps you going? And like I said, there might be an underlying reason. Because uh, the other one I put down was Chris Hoy, which I thought the same, like, just getting on a bike and going round in circles, yeah. which that's what it looks like to a lot of people. But what, what's your... What's your motivation? What's your target every day? How do you maintain your motivation? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Because because it must be it it must be mind numbing. Like at times where you think, is that enjoyable anymore? Um, because like I said, them two sports there, the, nothing really changes. Yes, you you're racing someone, but there's no external factors around. Like in a football match, someone could come and tackle you. Someone could take a ball off you. Yeah. There, it's basically you yourself. And, and that kind of, like I said, going, going in, can, can you transfer them things into, like I'm talking about young players with you at the minute, about can you self-regulate yourself in a football environment? Well, it'd be interesting to see, uh, would you want to get in a pool at four o'clock every morning? Oh, powerful again. And, and go on, who was your third one? Without going into too much Tiger detail. Woods. Tiger Woods. Tiger God, Woods. Look at that. So just, uh, the other one as well was kind of like, just staying at the top. So, like, Personal experience, probably about four or five years ago, I did I did a ten k race and uh, in terms of running and trained and trained and trained for it. Uh, did really well, got just under forty minutes, which I was really really happy mm. with. But then I hit that peak, and then I kind of accomplished it, and I didn't have the next target, and it probably taught me a bit of a life lesson, like what was the next target? Whereas, like I said, Woods, Phelps, Hoy. They've been at the top of their sports for forever, and like you can throw that in it. A lot of sports sports people like there's there's lords out there, but they were just three that kind of come to mind. Obviously, what? the Michael Jordan stuff at the minute um, with the Last Dance, and he was similar. It's just what what makes you go. I won one, but I'm going again. Like Messi and Ronaldo, they have all the money in the world. They've got nothing. They have to want for anything. What makes Messi go? I'm going training today. I've got a good friend who does some work in around the idea of, you know, serial winners. How do these people keep going again? And I think, you know, there's lots of stuff around, for me anyway, around the, the importance of having a goal and the purpose behind it. You know, and, and we've talked and I think you've shared about how you've repurposed yourself. You've come into a new job, you know, and you've gone again, you know, and also how do we help, how do we help our players and the people around us recognise, you know, you've got players coming back into Salford who who might have been, um, you know, released from a club and how do we get them back up again to go again? You know, and I think there's a really, really important piece here which you've, you've highlighted for me. And what, what I've also picked up very strongly is your desire to continue to keep learning and developing. And you also mentioned, you know, other little, little uh, projects or goals that you've got in your back of your mind. Um, and just to wrap us all up, uh, you know, I'd like to just offer you the opportunity to say where anybody might be able to make contact with you should they want to find out a little bit more about some of your ideas or the great work that you've been doing at Salford or even the great work previously that you did at Burnley. How might they get hold of you? The best two probably Twitter, uh, Lewis Craig 11, Twitter, and then the same probably just via my personal email, lewiscraig11 at gmail.com. Um, anything around, like I'm very open to... Like you, like you know yourself, visits and talking to people and, and trying to try to push myself forward because I think I'm in this stage at the minute of done a lot of 
university and course is over the years it's that implementation stage i think i called it where how where does this work for me how does this fit how where can i use this how can i use that um i think that's a big a, a big part that coaches kind of don't look at sometimes it's kind of get me badges get everything as soon as i can um take some time to, to experiment with a few things yeah well lewis thanks for sharing that and and just to echo that back to you is you know you are, have been for me a real living example of stretching and pushing yourself and being a bit of a sponge to uh, learning opportunities surrounding yourself with good people having good conversations you know and I, I would just like to wish you good luck in the next stage of your career I do hope um, that I'll be a part of it you know and we continue to have these conversations and, and who knows hopefully within the next year or so we might come back together and talk on the sports stories podcast and have a, a further follow-up conversation about the next part of your journey but good luck at Salford good luck in the next bit of your career uh, keep in touch and thanks once again perfect thanks a lot Dave see you time. so there we have a fantastic and honest account from Lewis recalling his journey from loving football and aspiring to be a professional right the way through to now having really exciting opportunities in developing young players in a brand new academy at Salford City Hearing Lewis's story and knowing him as I do, a key aspect of his career in sport has been getting to know himself better and the importance of investing in his own development. For me, these are key components for all of us to give attention to if we desire to be purposeful, happy and gain some level of success in our lives. So with this in mind, I'd like to pose the following questions for you to think about. Who are the three people you spend the most time with and what impact do they have on you? positively and or negatively. Also, what is your next short-term goal and how clear is it to allow you the best opportunity to be successful in achieving it? As always, I'm keen that the podcast provides some form of enjoyment and insight as well as give you something to think about that would help you positively move your life forward. So to end, a quick reminder, please let your friends, family and colleagues know about the Sports Stories podcast. Please also leave us a comment on Apple and the other podcast and social media platforms as this really helps attract new listeners. And if you would like to speak with me about any of the topics or questions raised today or simply provide some ideas or feedback, then contact me at sportstories247 at gmail.com. So from me, Dave Levine, have a great week, look after yourself, and I look forward to you joining me next week for another insightful, inspirational and motivational Sports Stories podcast.